to veer pretty pretty directly towards the longer term issues right i mean there was some differences of opinion on how we deal with countering extremism on whether in fact as i've been said it's even a useful vocabulary to be using but there was almost a consensus around the importance of network expansion delivery of long term essential services but Vikram also teed up a really important question around all that, which is you can't do all of it. How are we going to prioritize? And we have a terrific group of people here to give us a sense of what's working, where the challenges are, and where you think the, uh, the uh, you know, added value, the priority should be. So let me very quickly introduce our panelists and turn it over to them. Um, Josh here, Josh Nesbitt is the Executive Director of Frontline SMS Medic, coordinating projects to help health workers communicate, coordinate patient care, and provide diagnostics using low-cost mobile technology. And I know you are currently advising on ICT projects in about 15 countries, so we, including Haiti, so we've got lots of great experience here. Margaret, who I said earlier, Margaret Orrig, has just returned yesterday from Kabul, uh, where she works with USAID's DAI's IDEA program, improving the function of local economy value change, chains for the elimination of opium production. And Margaret also brings a wealth of experience working in policy planning for development and health services, so she'll have a um, good perspective on the transformational role of cell phones at the village level, I understand, uh, in coordinating village level services and enterprise. Siddhartha, who introduced himself, Siddhartha Raja, is a policy analyst with the global ICT department at the World Bank. He's our big picture telecoms guy, uh, having just come back from that conference there in Kabul. And we want to hear what people are talking, we're talking about at the conference in Kabul, get some fresh news on what they are struggling with where their priorities are in Afghanistan. Merrick Schaefer, Technical Project Coordinator, UNICEF's innovation team, utilizing cutting edge technology and strategies, including mobile social networking to bring youth together and coordinate health services um, to pregnant mothers and inf infants in a number of countries. And also I understand you spend a lot of time a lot of that time you spent in Africa has spent climbing the region's highest cliffs as well. <laughs> so he's used to dangerous discussions like this. And Katrin, um, Katrin Furklas is the co-founder and editor of mobileactive.org, coordinating a network of practitioners on mobile projects relating to governance, accountability, M banking and political participation in emerging democracies. Really one of the earliest people who worked in this field. And so we are very, very lucky to have her huge experience in private and public IT management and online mobilization. Also a 2009 TED Fellow. Congratulations. Um, all right. So let me follow the precedence of the previous panels and have the conversation open and opened by folks who have Afghanistan-specific experience to be talking about right now uh, when it comes to service delivery via mobile, Margaret and Siddhartha. And the question on the table, folks, is where do you see future opportunities for using mobile in to deliver these services? Why aren't we doing that already? What are the big challenges? And then have the rest of the panel respond when it comes to those challenges. All right? Uh, Margaret, let me go to you first. Um, like you noted, I work for a USAID-funded project called Idea New. And I'll just tell you quickly, we have a mobile-based system now. Um, it's a market information system, and it's a component of a wider agriculture project. So we have lots of demonstration farms. Uh, we have a radio show where we give ag extension information. People can call in and ask questions. Um, and then the other component of it is is right now SMS-based, and you can um, send a, an SMS and get the price of 25 different commodities in 11 different markets. It's all the major markets in Afghanistan and one in Peshawar in Pakistan. 
And recently, the, the two biggest problems we had had with our system were, um, one, illiteracy rates, people not using the system because they didn't understand it, even after training, even after demonstra demonstrations. And the other was a sustainability issue of a U.S.-funded project. Um, so recently, we started a partnership actually with Roshan and Mercy Corps to address these two issues specifically. Right now, we're developing, um, and this week it should be completed, a interactive voice response. So you can call up, um, and it says, you know, for apples, press one. You press one, and then you can hear the price of apples in all the markets. Uh, and then it also addresses the second issue of sustainability through using a private provider, um, hopefully generating enough revenue and um, you know, being able to expand it on a national platform. So that's our project. I welcome questions about it. And um, we, just for usage rates, we get about 14 to 1,500 SMSs on a biweekly basis, and it varies according to the season. So usually in fruit harvest seasons, we get more. Um, and a lot of traders, we find, use our system, um, a lot more than farmers are actually using it right now. Uh, and I just I wanted to say I appreciated uh, Nick Blockwood's comments about you know keeping things really simple and and addressing just really really basic and simple issues, <coughs> and that's what we've tried to do with our system is is just get information to farmers about about commodity prices to help them, you know, um, I guess to help them get better prices in the market for their products. Challenges you're facing? Um, well, I mean the two biggest challenges are Ill illiteracy and. And, and the sustainability issue. The other um, issue is, is you know, getting farmers, I guess, to to use the system and to understand it. And it takes a lot of in-person reinforcement, you know, m more than just one time. But you know, get, sort of getting farmers to understand what price information's uses are for them and how they can benefit from it in the short term and and over the long term. Thanks, Margaret Sidhat. I had a 52-slide presentation. Uh, no, I'm just joking. But um, uh, I, I do want to maybe run through just uh, to give you an idea of the kind of work we're trying to do at the World Bank. As you know, the, the World Bank does not uh, implement projects directly. We work through the government. And so our focus really has been on what we're calling mobile government or using mobile applications for service delivery and program management. Uh, so it, it's hard to really segment the panels, uh, but really the first panel we talked about uh, program management, uh, where you want to supervise programs, you want to get money out into the field, you want to pay salaries, uh, you want to verify that uh, a beneficiary has received a service or an asset has been created where it's supposed to be. So we're trying to, on the one hand, do, do stuff like this, uh, but we've talked about that earlier, so I won't go into much detail right now. I will focus a bit more on the service delivery aspect, which is, of course, the, uh, the topic of conversation for this panel. Uh, to, to kind of reinforce a point that was made earlier, and I think uh, must be reinforced repeatedly, is um, that mobile applications are not a silver bullet. Right? They're not going to solve the world's problems. It's a tool. It's a great tool. It'll help expand service delivery. It'll get information to people who never had information before or were not receiving the right information. But it has to be backed up by solid government services at some level, physical access point, community service centers, birthing centers, whatever they might be. But there needs to be something at the back office that backs up uh, the mobile phone. Uh, it, that cannot be the only solution here. However, in Afghanistan, uh, things are just beginning. And uh, I'm happy to tell you, and speaking of the workshop that we had last, uh, last uh, week on Tuesday, uh, it, it, first of all, I will say one thing. Uh, in February, we had the first workshop on mobile applications for government. Uh, this was actually on Liberation Day. Uh, if, you, if you know the history of Afghanistan, uh, this was the day, uh, February 15th, when uh, the Soviet army left Afghanistan. And it's a, it's a pretty big holiday. People showed up on the holiday, right, uh, and, and attended a day-long workshop on this topic. And these were people from the government, from the mobile phone companies, and so on. And I think this was really a kind of a, a voting with their feet of uh, how important they think this topic was. So just to reinforce and sort of uh, to, to, uh, to commend them on the high level of interest. And subsequently... We've had a series of discussions with uh, various ministries across government, 
And in every case, uh, there was a high level of interest in how they can use mobile telephones for a variety of uh, service delivery as well as program management purposes. The interesting, a uh, couple of interesting statistics, uh, just, just for everyone's benefit here. 52% of surveyed households, uh, there were 4,000 households that the Asia Foundation surveyed in 2009. 52% of these had mobile phones, at least one mobile phone in them. And in rural areas, this number was about 44%. So today, at least surveys tend to show that there is widespread reach, and this is very encouraging. Even more encouraging, uh, and I think Adam will also like this statistic if he hasn't all this, uh, haven't, haven't got this already, 11% of Afghans surveyed by the Asia Foundation reported that they use SMS to get news and information about current events at least once a week. 11%, right? So this is also quite encouraging. It shows that there's a demand for information, uh, that even with the uh, literacy problems and all the other issues that we're facing, 11% of people uh, use the mobile phone to get news and information, especially by SMS. Now, in terms of the economic opportunity as well, which is, of course, very interesting when, you, when we think about uh, economic development, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we project that the market for mobile applications in all their forms could, incre could become something like $30 million in terms of revenues by 2015. Uh, this is, uh, in Afghanistan, a significant amount of money. And this is a very, very conservative estimate. If, you, uh, if you're familiar with the market in, for example, India, it's already crossed uh, more than a uh, billion dollars uh, very, very quickly. And it's amazing what people pay money for, right? They pay money for ringtones and for astrology uh, information. There's a joke in India that uh, the things that make money are A, B, C, astrology, Bollywood, and cricket, right? So <laughs> people spend a lot of money on this stuff. And the funny thing is in Afghanistan as well, even with uh, very, very simple media services over the mobile phone, people are paying 10 apps a minute or something like 25 cents a minute to listen to music on their cell phones, right? So this is, uh, it's interesting. That shows that there's really demand out there for content, uh, and hopefully we'll have more sophisticated content in the future. Regarding the, regarding the kinds of <laughs> possibilities, uh, of course, we have one great example here of the agriculture information service that uh, DAI has already been working on. But there are a, a couple of other services that we're thinking about implementing over the next couple of years. Uh, one of these, just to give you an example, <coughs> is a health hotline service that will connect uh, community uh, midwives and community health workers. This is about 27,000 people across Afghanistan to specialists who are located typically in the five or six major cities. So the estimate, just, this is a, not a government estimate, this is a private estimate just to provide the disclaimer, suggests that there's about 200 OBGYNs across Afghanistan. And if anyone's familiar with this uh, country, they know that maternal mortality and infant mortality are tremendously high. Uh, with just 200 OBGYNs, it's impossible to get them to serve rural areas, right? Uh, it might be therefore possible to at least have the community midwife or the community health worker get better information on a rapid response basis from these specialists who are located in the city. So this is something we're trying to figure out. Um, there's a couple of rural development programs that the World Bank is very, very uh, heavily involved in, um, and we're trying to figure out how we can use mentorship services over uh, Twitter-like SMS systems uh, for village-level entrepreneurs and village-level producers. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, program called Mobile Movement Kenya, which did something similar in Kibera, which is a slum just outside Nairobi, where they connect these micro-entrepreneurs in Kibera with people on the internet who are willing to pay small amounts of money to support those mi micro-entrepreneurs or give them some kind of business advice. So maybe it's possible to do something similar in Afghanistan and uh, shock and awe them into, uh, into entrepreneurship. Uh, okay. But, but coming, to the, coming to the challenges, uh, I, I will just want to, of course, reiterate the sustainability question. Uh, as one uh, government official told me, there are too many pilots and too few planes. So we need to you know, get beyond that. Uh, there's also the technical questions. There's also technical questions like uh, handsets that are very simple that force us to stick to SMS and voice-based services, a very limited base of skills within the country in terms of applications development, uh, and, and even within the public sector to use IT strategically or ICT strategically. And then when it comes to users, and I'll just end on this, uh, 
there's really five different issues that need to need to be addressed. And I'm focusing on this because we've talked a lot about users. There's low literacy rates, which of course we can overcome through voice services, but still it's an impediment. There's limited access to mobile phones among women. And this is, uh, this is a huge issue, especially when you talk about things like maternal health, for example. There's limited use currently of non-voice services. Uh, people still in Afghanistan don't use SMS as much as they do in the other South Asian countries, for example. The, the, the fourth is uh, the need to get intermediaries involved and get them to get subscribers onto the, onto the service and to educate users on how they can use these applications. And finally, again, to repeat, there is a need for the back office. There's a need to you know, respond to those complaints, to respond to the, to, the, to, the, to the demand for physical services. And so we need to really focus on this as well. And maybe just the last sentence I'll say is that the, the, the bank is in the process of uh, considering how it can support uh, the government in its moves towards uh, ubiquitous government or mobile government. And we're thinking of uh, you know, a project, and I can get into that uh, in some more detail subsequently. But I know my time is up, so I'll turn it back to Shad. Thank you all. So we heard a lot of World Bank's looking at infant mortality program. I'm sorry, World Bank's looking at programs to support midwives, programs in commercial uh, air, in, in the commercial space where DAI already is. Um, we heard lots of different ideas. Again, let me turn to our discussants here and say you guys have a tremendous amount of experience between Katrine and Merrick and Josh in all of these areas. How do you? What sounds to you? like it's got the most potential. How do you start to think about prioritizing among these things? Let me start at the end there with Katrina, what we haven't heard from, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, it's great to be at the end. <laughs> so, panel, um, let me say one thing. There's been a lot that's been tried, and I've kind of seen it all in the last five years. Um, we actually have uh, a new uh, event called Fail Fair, where we look at the projects that failed and what was learned from it. And as was noted, many pilots, many don't exist anymore, and there's lessons to be learned there. The, the primary lesson, I think that we, there's, a, there's one coming to your town, Washington, D.C., <laughs> July 26th, at the bank, in fact, okay. uh, who is a partner in this, uh, and we'll be presenting some of the failures. Um, because this is such a fast-moving field, I think we make a couple of wrong assumptions. One is that the penetration of mobile phones, we, we infer that because mobile phones are being adopted at such a rapid pace, that development should happen equally as fast. Development is hard. Development is slow. Institution building and capacity building is slow and it's hard. The problem is not the technology. The, the, there is, there, I don't even want to say the problem is the people because that's not true either. Um, but I think all of us who are in this field um, and have done development work um, realize that the, the, the approach needs to be slightly different. And I say this you know, with all love for technology, because I do love it and, uh, you know, very dearly. It provides opportunities um, for a bunch of things. So the other, the other thing I think that we see, particularly in those fail fair events that we've done, is that there is an absolute lack of user focus. We don't focus on the user. So, you know, many of you come up with great ideas and then wonder why people aren't coming. Um, which I think is where the private sector is really good at, right? Because if you don't have users, you don't make any money, and you're gone. S development organizations don't really understand that. Um, so a focus on users and where they're at, whether that's with simple handsets, whether that's with voice services, you know, all these questions that were being raised, please ask, go back and ask your users or your potential users. Um, that said, let me tell you about three different um, projects that I thought were really interesting that I've personally been involved in. One is, and I'm really glad that you guys are adding IVR. Mm -hmm. One is a project that we just implemented in Zimbabwe, and it's an audio news service It's of a political nature, um, where we put up a very simple open source system with 24 outgoing lines, four incoming lines, um, where users ping the system or send an SMS and get a return call back with information 
about various um, news events, etc. In an information-starved environment, that's a really interesting proposition. It's been up for three days, received 3,000 calls, and it's being um, promptly shut down um, partially by um, the powers that be because they don't really like it. So there's now 21 lines open. <laughs> uh, a few lines were shut down. So this whole notion of voice services, n not just SMS, particularly for illiterate and multilingual um, population is really interesting. The service that we set up there was in three languages and you can choose from the outset what you want. So I applaud you that you're thinking about voice, which is what every phone can do. Um, the second project, um, and I heard a lot about service delivery, that is broadcast. I heard very little about sort of incoming. The Crime Stopper program certainly is one, but it's, you know, it's an interactive medium, and so there's two ways in which to communicate. So we did um, a very interesting project with the UN, a new um, project under the Deputy, Deputy Secretary General called UN Global Pulse, which was two things. One, mobile data collection through intermediaries, community health workers, or bottom-up through people um, at large. We did an inventory of all of the projects that are out there. Who's doing what? There's hundreds of them, hundreds. Mobile phones are great for data collection, bottom-up data collection. Um, the second one was a, a 10 country mobile poll. It's not even a survey because it wasn't statistically um, uh, significant, but it was a, an attempt to figure out how fast can you get sentiment uh, data from people in various different regions. And we worked with partners, and it was you know, very interesting to see how fast you could actually get information with partners, through partners, from regular people on the street. So if you're trying to figure out you know, what is the mood, what is the, what is the situation in a particular um, region, what are early warning symptoms, right? how, how are you feeling about the economy, you know, are you able to feed your family, better or worse than last year, those were some of the questions we asked because UN Global Pulse is interested in, in uh, vulnerability um, data. And so, you know, it's not necessarily statistically, you know, relevant or um, representative, however, it gives a sense of what is, you know, the same way that Ushahidi can give a sense of bottom-up data collection aggregated on a platform like Ushahidi can give a sense of what is the sentiment on the ground. Um, so thinking about mobile communication as, as um, two-way. You know, I'll, I'll leave it at that because I, <laughs> I see the nods. But I invite you to actually think about, uh, you know, your users, if I want to make a final point, and, and find out where they're at and what they need. Josh. Sure. So, really great points, and I think that I'm going to echo something that we've heard all day long, and that's that what we're talking about are tools and not solutions. And that means that we need to start with what we have and what we know. And um, very quickly, my background is in international health and bioethics, and Frontline SMS is a free and open source software platform that basically lets anyone with a laptop and a USB dongle coordinate large amounts of contacts and incoming and outgoing text messages, do little manipulations like auto-replies, auto-forwards, and whatnot, and has been downloaded about 8,500 times by NGOs all over the world to do different work in different sectors. And Frontline SMS Medic is a nonprofit focused on healthcare, and we've implemented projects in 11 countries, mostly sub-Saharan Africa, but also India, Bangladesh, Honduras, and, and most recently Haiti. Um, but uh, getting back to what we do know, uh, we do know that there are roughly 40,000 uh, informal and formal community health workers on the ground in Afghanistan. And we do know that roughly a quarter of children are dying before they're five. And we do know that uh, maternal mortality has peaked numerous times in Afghanistan. And so there are very concrete needs on the ground. And part of what I wanted to do today was just to listen, because I think that we have the most success in this field when the people who uh, know the ground truth and uh, our subject matter experts then come to the technologists and say, you know, what can we do now? And what can we do in three months? What can we do in six months? And what's going to be ready in five years? So that's the first point I wanted to make. Um, second is when we're talking about service delivery, uh, a lot of times what we're talking about is really um, how can we use these mobile tools to help you do what you already do, but do it better, more efficient, faster, 
um, with greater impact and reach and in certain contexts more safely. So that might mean uh, just simple uh, security alerts and coordination built on top of what you're already doing. Uh, next, I, I wanted to say that you know, in context, and we've lost some of the military folks, but you know, a, a really good strategy from what I can tell is uh, to win over a population by keeping them alive and healthy, right? Um, <laughs> absolutely, right? And, and I think that, to be honest, um, what I've seen to make that happen is, is really local action and local actors. So the more that we can do to put the tools in, in, the, in the hands of those local actors, the better off we're going to be. Um, next, I wanted to sort of get us a little bit excited about the, the tech, and Katrine gives me a hard time for, for hype in mobile a lot, and I think rightly so, but I think that there are technologies that are uh, sort of on the cusp. Um, so we're seeing um, offline uh, electronic medical records for patients um, that you can use anywhere you have a mobile signal. You're seeing uh, really interesting online and offline uh, mapping platforms with Ushaidi and Health Map and managing news that I think are going to provide really smart platforms for public health officials as they're making decisions about disease burdens and resource allocation. Uh, we're going to see really smart supply chain monitoring. This is actually really low-hanging fruit um, based on what we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, then there's the slightly crazier stuff, but I think it's coming quite soon. Really excited about the Swift River project at Ushahidi to help us manage large <laughs> data streams. Rob Monroe, based out of Stanford, is working on artificial in intelligence and uh, basically subword natural language processing so we can take large amounts of text messages sent free form in all different languages and, and auto categorize them based on learning algorithms. I think that sort of thing uh, can, that linked into a network of 40,000 community health workers uh, can really uh, start uh, to give both local actors and decision makers at the policy level the information they need. Um, and then, that's not hype, that's smart. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, thanks. Um, so maybe a little bit of hype. Coming very soon is MMS-based diagnostics. So built on top of the data connectivity, once we're seeing MMS fly around, uh, we're seeing really innovative groups in the U.S. Um, Idegan Ozjan's group out of UCLA has basically figured out how to hack a $15 camera phone to do intracellular imaging. Um, so you can slide a blood sample to the back of the phone, shine uh, an LED on the sample and catch a holographic image, then transmit that by MMS. And the goal is for something to sit in our software and basically uh, run a simple query, um, a simple algorithm to compare that incoming image to a cell library and shoot back a diagnosis by SMS. So that'll take 10 seconds, cost about 15 cents, and be done anywhere you can send an MMS. So there's that. There's Diagnostics for All is doing paper-based diagnostics. So there are innovations that are exploding on top of this infrastructure and get me really excited because I think it's going to save a lot of lives. And I think sort of the last point, again, in, in sort of the context of security is, you know, can we innovate faster, and can a goal be to make people's lives better? That's a question. All right, Josh, I'm not going to let you off the hook, though. You've got all these options out there, all this wonderful, cool, whiz-bang technology. We've been sitting here all morning talking about making sure the solutions fit the problems. What's the one piece you would say to Vikram if you were sitting here or uh, anyone else, the European Union, this should happen now? Yep. Okay, so I, I'm not the right person to to come up with that need. I think you know, put uh, put me on a plane or give me a, a Skype call with 50 physicians on the ground in Afghanistan, and I'll have a much better answer. Um, but I think that it's really low hanging fruit like patient tracking, making sure that patients that have entered care at some point continue to remain in care and in the system, that can be accomplished with a couple of text messages flying around and linking into pre-established social networks and is really low-hanging fruit. And you've seen that happen Absolutely. in lots of other places. All right, Merrick, let's bring us home. Hello. So uh, I'm part of uh, the UNICEF Innovation Group. We started about two and a half years ago, and we had a director that uh, let us fail. And uh, that was the only reason we succeeded at anything at all. Uh, and it was quite a blessing, especially in the UN context. Um, most of the failures have been uh, safely swept under the rug, except for when we expose them at things like fail fair um, in a dramatic and, and hopefully learning environment sort of way. Um, it's a safe environment. A safe environment, yeah. So um, 
I basically agree a lot with what the other people who've done practitioner level work have to say. I myself uh, spent the last few months in Zambia working inside health clinics in the middle of nowhere with minimal connectivity, uh, trying to understand what the needs were from that perspective. And so I'd like, to, I think, to speak a little bit about sort of the inside, the guts of how to think about one of these projects to make it successful. I think that the, the, the problems do, as, as Josh uh, eloquently stated, have to come from the, the people who have them. They can't come from us sitting in this room here. Uh, and the conversations need, it needs to be, you need to have conversations to arrive at those problems. Now you can pick sectors. You should maybe pick health, and maybe you should pick uh, clinics. You know that's a, that's a place where there's a lot of opportunities. And before I mentioned target audiences, so people who have phones and, and know how to use them or can be trained to use them, um, and you can leverage them to access tons of people who don't have phones. And I think that's one of the things that that people often mis, mis, misthink is that oh someone has to have a phone to receive the benefit of a phone service. And this isn't true at all. In fact, we're working with a lot of clinics that don't even have mobile wireless coverage. Uh, but the people working in those clinics walk every week to the, to the BOMA, the business area in, in the regions I work in, with their phones to communicate with friends and family, and they can then interact with our systems asynchronously to get health data and pass it back and forth. So you don't even have, have to have coverage to address some of these issues. You have to understand the problem of, of, of the people on the ground. So that being said, I think that the question needs to be reversed. It doesn't need to be what can mobile technologies do for us. It should be what are the problems where mobile technologies are appropriate. And so, for example, our last project, we uh, sat down with about 50 health workers um, from three districts in, in the far north of Zambia where there's, there's no electricity and, and very little coverage. And we had them do gap analysis on what services they were providing to their communities, what they were doing well, what they, what they weren't doing well. First thing everyone came up with was, we need ambulances, we need doctors. And uh, we said, yes, you do. Um, however, we don't have the budget for that. What, what can we do with the sort of limited resources budgets that we have? And uh, they basically uh, identified about 13 areas that were like fundable, small, real-world um, um, interventions, health interventions in the, in the clinic context where, they, where they, could, they could provide value to their communities that were mattered to them. Then we stepped in and we looked at that list and we said, where does mobile fit in this context? And we were able to identify about 10 areas that we thought, and we prioritized those down to three, and we ended up building out two in a very iterative fashion, working from inside the clinics. Well, we were at a hotel down the street, but we'd go to the clinics like almost every, every other day with a little bit of working software and what's known as agile software development, and have people play with it and try it and give us advice. And we started off going in this direction. This is after reading the gap analysis and thinking it through. We started going this direction, and we swerved like this and ended up with sort of a very different project and product at the end. And I think it takes that kind of, if you want to have an impact and you want to have something that matters to people and can influence their, their, their decision at a propaganda level, you have, to service that, you have to develop a service that matters to them. And, and to do that, you need to engage the user in a way that, that isn't just a focus group or a survey or I read a case study somewhere. You actually have to get your hands dirty. And so if you do have a huge amount of money, because this takes money and it takes time to do this, maybe the investment should really be in getting people invested in the places where the problems are. And then you can... You can then have people on the outside help build the technological components or help build the network components to support that. But it's really about what, what is the problem that's relevant to the person uh, who has it. Let me, let me add two things. And, we, you know, we already do a lot of this. The bank is right now in the process of trying to figure out how to fund mobile innovation labs in sub-Saharan Africa. Okay? Put one in every country or ten. Yeah. Right? Working with local schools, universities, you know, small and medium-sized enterprise is what makes economies, to your earlier point, you know, mobile technology, fastest-growing technology, you know, build that kind of capacity. Um, I even came back from a trip to Afghanistan looking at media um, organizations there. They're, as was noted, people are hungry for media. What's the delivery we vehicle, the communication vehicle? available mobile phones. So how can we strengthen media organizations so that the person who's on that, who was that, the uh, elected official or the government bureaucrat who's on the radio? Okay, we have Twitter here. How about a SMS text and service for every radio station in Afghanistan so that when there's people on the radio, they can actually interact with the audience in real time. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, are being done. They're, they're, it is to some extent not super rocket science, and I would look to, you know, the people who are doing hard work on the ground. And I wish, Ivan, you had said more about this, <laughs> actually, in some of your findings. But yeah. um, to, to you know, look at the kinds of leverage points that, that Merrick was talking about, talking about that are, that build that mosaic 
piece by piece by piece by piece looking at what is already there and what and, people really want. And, and I think that a key piece of that is, is addresses design solutions that can scale, that are not dependent upon uh, donations of text messages, that are not dependent upon donations of phones or, or infrastructure that doesn't exist. And also design things in a sustainable way in the sense of bring local people into both the design process at the, at the conceptual level, ministries of health, local officials, as well as the people building the technology. We always try to hire local software developers. They don't know the languages we program in, uh, and it doesn't matter. By the end of the project, they've learned, they've learned a new software development language, they've learned a new way of working, and they've actually built the software with us. When we walk away, they fix it, they build it, and they take on and do other projects with it. All right, if there's one message that's coming through loud and clear here, it's start with the problem, identify the right problems. And we have lots of Afghanistan expertise around this table. As Katrine pointed out, Ivan has just been out there. We have Shinor, who's just over from Kabul. Um, Adam, I know you've tried a, a number of these things at the district level in Afghanistan, and Nick has spent plenty of time out there. So let's talk about the problems. Uh, let's talk about what you found, first of all, Ivan, when you were out there, and then we'll go over to Eric. Well, I mean, link, linking SMS uh, and mobile technology into mass mass communications is a, is something that's been happening in Afghanistan since probably 2005. Um, you know, and many many of you probably saw the the documentary Afghan Star about Tolo TV's Colin, you know, uh, talent show, which was based on an SMS texting, and that was the most visible early example. Though there were lots of others, and uh, almost every mass media outlet that is, you know, that has I would say mo most of them now actually have uh, SMS texting, as far as I know. That, that they both have call-in programs, and they have um, the opportunity to ask people to text in information and so on and so forth. I know that many uh, radio stations in Afghanistan use the frontline SMS platform. So this is a this is a this is a, prog a progression of of, uh, of engagement that's been occurring for quite a few years. And and if all of us focused on the user and uh, focused on Afghan experience and asking ask, asking Afghans what it is that they want, rather than trying to impose a viewpoint or impose a solution. I think maybe there might not even be a war. I mean, that may be a little bit <laughs> radical for me to say, but you know. I'm all for that. Um, one other idea here, which is that we we often have in the development space an obsession with scaling, and for certain projects and certain ideas, big is good. Absolutely, you know, for certain large. You know, if you're talking about revising or, or building a, you know, an entire educational system, for instance, and you certainly do need large strategic issues that need to be involved. But one of the nice things about networks is that you can have lots of small networks with lots of local people doing lots of things for relatively small communities. And sometimes that's a really good thing. Sometimes networks don't need to scale. Um, they can be focused on a particular problem for a particular context. And so, and maybe they're replicable in other places, but... I would I would urge some humility in in that on that side, and if something doesn't grow beyond a certain size, um, throwing money at it to try to make it grow is probably not a good idea. Maybe maybe that's where it should live. And I'll stop there. Hmm. Eric, you had something you want to say? Yeah, if you're going to be building these, you need to be very technical, um, and this is something you can't outsource. Uh, technical partners are, are valuable, yeah, but you actually need to start building up really in-house technical uh, expertise. And they're they're just they're just simply are um, the, the majority of uh, the majority of NGOs operating on the ground right now that are trying to tackle some of these questions do not have the technical depth to be able to take advantage of the actual uh, te uh, technology. It is nice to see groups like UNICEF that have invested in creating a dedicated uh, tech tech team internally. Um, if you silo your tech uh, your, um, and, and, and outsource it, you, you, you're just not going to be able to get the wins out of it. Is that to say we should be investing a lot more in technical training in country? Is that what, what you're that, that too, but also in D.C. No, like, like <laughs> um, okay, so ma maps. Like, we're, I mean, this is a room full of map lovers, just, just I'm, I'm sure. How, how, how many how many of these NGOs are actually able to 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 put their projects on the map? Like, and actually just work with some basic GIS data? Like, I managed to get out of grad school without ever opening something like ARC. Like, I've only learned this in the last couple of years. Like, this is this this is starting to get really uh, really silly. 
that, that so many of us were, are, are, are able to be tackling some serious problems without having basic competences. You know, you look back 20 years ago and certain people, you know, certain managers were not properly able, uh, maybe 20 years ago is a little too long, but, you know, certain managers were not able to actually use an Excel spreadsheet or actually be, be, be proficient in, uh, in, in, in a computer. Um, you're, some of the problems that we're talking about trying to solve actually require a certain level of proficiency. And if you don't have this on your team, uh, you're just going to be cut at the knees here. I'd like to add on to that, I mean, <clears throat> structure so that they can make things better all the time. I mean, I really, you can find an infinite number of people, contractors, who are willing to sell you these services. I, I have to admit to having been in the contracting consultancy community for about seven years at one point, we'll sell you anything. But if you really want to end up with these tailored solutions to something, you need at least a few people in-house mm -hmm. who really know what they're talking about and how to manipulate this stuff, or you can't get tailored to where it's, it's actually delivering to your clientele. No, I I exactly. And, and then back to, Sheldon, your point about uh, in-country expertise, yes. And the only way to actually have real in-country expertise that is technical is to actually work with open source software. Where people can actually put their hands in code, it's going to. It's already uh, oftentimes more superior and more secure. You start throwing in the sustainability factor. Um, it, it just needs to be better reflected in uh, proposals. I think that um, you know, a lot of stuff is going on, and a lot of organizations that are on the ground are talking to the people on the ground. Um, and let me just try and explain mm -hmm. what I mean by that. You know, here's telemedicine. I mean, telemedicine started because in my role, I went and visited hospitals, and they've got MRI machines, X-ray machines, and they're collecting dust. They don't have power to operate it. They don't have the expertise to operate it, and they get it donated. So how do you address that issue? Security is a problem. Language is a problem. How do you get doctors, trainers on the ground to teach people? That's expensive. So you sit there and you say, okay, the medical experts know this, the ministry knows this, and can facilitate certain things, and the technology partner knows this. Let's put together everybody and come up with a program that helps. Now, telemedicine was put together to get e-consultation, teleradiology, because radiology was lacking, um, and e-learning. And now, after three years, looking at the numbers, we have seen the spike in the capacity that's been built as a result. And this has now expanded to Bamiyan and Faisabad, and we're looking at, um, you know, roving ambulance bikes, which have a cart for an ambulance that have an embedded mobile phone, which is a public call phone, a public call office, and a cash-in, cash-out point, so that there's a revenue generation model, but rural uh, villages can have these bikes and, and move around. Now, you're creating jobs, you're dealing with a health problem, you're helping the health community and NGOs deliver what they need to deliver, but you're using their expertise for what they do best. You're not getting them to write the technology or think up the business plan or get it financed. And I think this is where some of the frustration exists with people on the ground because so much money goes into uh, a variety of initiatives Whereas if people could really sit around the table and consolidate some of this so that people working in the health sector were focused, people working in the farming sector were focused, people working in the financial sector were focused, then we could leverage everything we have to actually deliver impact. If we look at the results of something like telemedicine and one laptop per child where Afghan curriculum is now digitized and Afghan kids are getting computers, we can show the impact. Why can't we roll it out? Because as one private organization with a government that has very little funds and the ability to access funds from agencies is three to one because we're a private sector, uh, entity, 
So if I go to Adam, I have to put up three times the money and he will give me one if I'm lucky. I'm very nice, Adam. You should give me money. <laughs> I'll give you anything you want. Oh, put that on record. <laughs> so, you know, I think the point here is that it would really help if the right people came round the table and we could really focus and deliver some of the things that are working rather than duplicating and starting. Maybe you need a mobile, mobile summit for do. development in Kabul yeah, or somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, look, else, at right? Ma- look at, um, you know, Malamat. We started yeah. Tradenet.com, which was market prices for farmers. You know, USAID came along with idea, a new idea. And basically, there were two systems working parallel. So we so sat we, down. Yeah, we sat down together. And, and we sat. put it together. So we're yeah. paying for IVR. You know, we're paying for an upgrade of the platform with them, with Mercy Corps. And now we'll have one service that looks at everything and a greater impact. Yeah. So I think that's really critically one of the challenges. Although that, I would argue that there, we're still in this phase where a thousand flowers can bloom, right? Yeah. We are different attempts yes. can be made at different things as long as they are communication yes. about what are we learning how can we up, you know leverage exactly. each other's platforms how can we leverage each other's networks how can we leverage certainly yeah the i think network. i think the mosaic is so complicated <laughs> you see you've got um, some decision makers in the field you've got some policy makers here in washington You've got private sector, some that are interested in development as well as profit, others that are purely interested in getting as much profit and nothing wrong with that and taking it out of the country. And you need to get, you know, some of these people round the table and really think about what's happening on the ground. We we really need to get out of the urgent fix crisis management mindset. And... uh, uh, I'm, I'm. So when I hear, and I'm, I'm sorry. I wish Vikram were still here. When I, but when I hear that we have to have, we can, if we could only find the one thing that leverages a solution, I just, I want to say, we just need to, maybe we need to slow down on some of that, because the considered approaches, it might be a little bit slower up front, but we might, we'll, we'll end up with a vastly better solution. Well, we don't have Vikram here, but we do have. Adam here, who struggles with these questions all the time within USAID. Adam, any thoughts? Um, <clears throat> Adam works for OTI, who has yeah. only had a short-term <laughs> mandate, and he just doesn't know what to say. <laughs> And he's promised me all his budget. There you go. (laughs) Not that I have a budget. Um, I'm an advisor and don't actually control any funds at all, which is part of the reason I could make that um, quip. Um, uh, Afghanistan presents, I I think Afghanistan presents a, a, a significant conundrum here. I mean, there are clearly long term needs that are desperate and that have relevance to the immediate. That said, there are also immediate needs and very pressing concerns right now, both of a developmental nature but also of a political nature, that require very quick and cogent and focused action. Um, You we aren't in a place where we can divorce ourselves from one or the other. We have to deal with both. Um, And the best approach that I can think of, and this is one that I try to take on in the the way that I go about the things that I consider as being reasonable and relevant and worth doing, is how do we respond to that immediate with our eye on the medium and longer term so that we aren't necessarily making our lives worse later, but potentially also improving the ground for further development later. And you, you, it requires, I I think this particular environment requires a, you have to be willing to fail. You have to be able to, to experiment. You have to be able to see things as they are and engage in a, as targeted in a specific 
a way as possible, making room for good things to either come about or good opportunities to emerge that you can then act on later. And OTI has underwritten private entities. We gave money to the Massenis, wrote them a check. Now there's Tolo TV and Armand FM. Uh, arguably the strongest single media player in Afghanistan to date and the the pioneer in in Afghanistan and a bunch of this other technology. Roshan partners with them a lot. Roshan is everywhere. <laughs> right. Um, and there are now a dozen television stations in Kabul um, that that are providing information to, to, to the Afghan public. So you you figure out what your best play is here, and then you try to figure out how you're going to make that impact the future, I guess. It's All right. We are at the end of time here. I, is there anybody out there who has a burning question for the panel before we um, uh, close out? And Anand, is there anybody online, um, any conversation online that you could share with us here? Give us a final thought. Yeah, there's um, there's been some interesting talk, uh, especially based on Siddhartha's comment about a particular part of the audience that we're trying to engage, which is women. And what are the programs that are being used, if at all? Uh, is that a gap that we're really failing to fill? That's, there's a lot of concern about that. I think that's probably the most burning question online. I have a, an interesting anecdote on this. I was sitting with uh, some um, field workers who are involved in what the bank calls the poultry program component of the horticulture and livestock program, <laughs> which is under the Ministry of Agriculture, Irrigation and Livestock. Let's talk about long titles. Uh, and, and we were talking about a market price information system and how this might work and so on. And they said, well, you know, the computer has to be a woman. And I was trying to understand what that meant. And of course, you know, I, I understood what they were trying to say, but I didn't understand the whole computer must be a woman thing. And basically, the explanation was that obviously, uh, as all the, the beneficiaries of the poultry program are women, they can only receive messages from women. And receiving a message from anything that seems remotely like a man, like a computer, I guess HAL 2000 or whatever, uh, will, will of course be frowned upon and may, may result in God knows what. And so we decided to come up with an interesting name for this, which is the Hen Information Network of Afghanistan, or HINA. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And on that note, I think, you know, we've talked about, there's been great ideation here around innovation, um, but really grounded in practicality and the challenges of working in Afghanistan. If there's one big idea that seems to have kind of taken on a life of its own across the day, it is, seems to me, that we should be having a conversation just like this in Kabul. And I, I, I think that seems to be a, a really strong push. Anybody on the panel uh, disagree? I know you've just had something like that, so... No, I was actually going to say that, uh, I, not that I can fund this thing, but I'd be happy to help organize it. Good. Uh, so... Uh, I don't know if mobile. That's not active. what we wanted to hear. We wanted to hear the funding <laughs> part. <Well. laughs> no. If yeah, you can write me the don't, check, I don't we mind. We don't do panels. No, but if uh, if you want to get together for a for a summit which you suggested, then I'll be happy to work with you on that. We have a little more interactive event left. Any other thoughts on that that idea of How about uh, a mobile bar camp? <laughs> <laughs> at, at the Taj. Sorry. Well, let me just tell you what we're going to do is um, uh, we're going to sort through this discussion. We are going to post the entire video archives online. It will be on USIP.org. We will also be culling kind of the good ideas and uh, creating a key takeaways document that we will make available to everyone um, in the hopes of the idea here is to help influence future decisions in policy making, prioritizing around funding, and so forth. And there have been lots of really interesting thoughts here. So we'll be out there for anyone to uh, access, and you'll be able to you know, reach out to any of the panelists after that. Before you all leave, let me just say one thing. I want to thank 
all of you for being such a great audience. My dad was a school teacher. He used to say that the key to a really good meeting is the audience listens, the, the speakers deliver useful information, the audience listens carefully, and we both finish our jobs at the same time. And I think we've sort of met that bar here. But a meeting like this doesn't happen without a lot of people who are behind the scenes, and I want to make sure to call them out. Um, the USIP staffers here of uh, Tyler Peterson and uh, Gerard and um, uh, Christopher New, who's hanging out there behind the, the, behind the glass, and last but not least, Anand Varghese, who's been kind of the point man on today. I promise you, these are the hardest working guys ever. I also want to, again, thank our co-sponsors, Nick and Tech Change, UN Mandated U University of Peace, um, the NDU, Mobile Accord, James Eberhardt, and I think I've included them all. So thank you again. Let me now declare the meeting officially adjourned. Appreciate you being here.